Today we're going to be talking about disappearing students, how to help students persist and succeed. And the agenda includes, we'll do some brief introductions and talk about different topics that and approaches that you can use to build community, integrate projects and assessments, feedback and um, assessments grading, and how you can weave all of these in to help students persist and succeed. And for the purpose of building community, I always model in the workshops. Um, so if you all would please raise your hand and, and then um, introduce yourself. Then, and I do this with my students because it helps them to know a little bit about each other and helps them to connect. So um, who wants to introduce um, themselves? We have Carol and Diane, who wants to introduce themselves first? I'm happy okay, to. Go ahead, Diane, thank you. Um, Diane Rogers, I am a professor in the sociology department and um, my area of research is social movement, science and technology studies, and I teach um, social theory. And I think I'm interested in this um, workshop in particular because of teaching online. And I find that seems to exasperate the disappearing student issue. And I have certain techniques I try, but I'm very open to learning more to, to keep okay. them in the class. Awesome. OK, thank you, Diane. Welcome. OK, go ahead, Carol. Uh, this is uh, Carol. Uh, I'm from the Department of Accountancy. I teach uh, upper level accounting classes. Uh, I have the same feeling with Diane, um, but I just want to see what other people are doing and learn from uh, other professors at the university. OK, awesome. OK, thank you. Welcome, Carol. OK, well, um, the first aspect of this helping students persist and um, proceed, uh, succeed is related to the importance of community. And, you know, a simple aspect of just starting to lay that foundation is the, the introductions. And we had those for this, for this workshop, when I do those in my class, I have specific open-ended questions, just a couple of them, that align with the topic of the course, and then something that if the students want to share about um, something maybe about their hobbies or their research interests or something that's specific to them in terms of the course or something outside, there might be a coffee um, cafe in the online course, then I'll have them share that as well. And so that builds that first foundation for community and connecting. And an aspect, another aspect of the building community is helping, uh, building in some group work, problem solving, empathy, um, diversity, um, when you're sharing content in online and face-to-face -face or hybrid, make sure that you have content that show, shows the various diversities of, of people and researchers and, and issues related to your topics. And so that when the students are looking at the content and working together as a group, trying to solve these problems, that they feel that they can see themselves in the content in this shared space. And when they're working together, um, you want to build in that um, opportunities for them to, to succeed, to solve problems effectively together and build their confidence, and use a scaffolding type of approach to first building those connections uh, between and among the students and with you. And then as you're doing that, you use more simple 
problems that they address and then scaffold to more complex problems. And so you want to practice this in your class and the way you have it designed so that they gain confidence as they continue to build this community. And when they feel that community and those connections, you'll see better attendance rates. And you'll see that their confidence, they'll feel more confident and comfortable talking in class, engaging, sharing their insights, because they, you've scaffolded this, these techniques that might be uncomfortable to them. Maybe they don't feel comfortable talking in class, or maybe they don't feel comfortable talking online um, or face to face. So you design the activities and the course discussions and things to give them opportunities to practice. And I do this, um, this semester I'm teaching a UNIB 101 course. And in the, in the spring, I teach um, advanced doctoral students. So that's, you know, the beginning of their experience at NIU and the um, end of their experience in graduate school. And I've used these scaffolding techniques and these ways to get them to practice communicating, practice sharing something, um, and using those simple templates to get them more comfortable. And I've definitely noticed that the students are opening up more, that they're, they're coming to class. They are starting to, they're feeling more comfortable sharing information and engaging. And it's, it's really fun to see that blossom in the, in the course. And so, um, and Diane's talking about social movements and social theory, and uh, we want to make sure that we are creating an inclusive space for our students and trying to build a, an environment where there are options for students and universal design for learning is a way to do that where you build in different types of media and conferencing com components, even for face-to-face -face classes. Um, welcome, Lise. Nice to see you. Um, and so those opportunities to connect with you and with each other helps them to feel included, that their voice is honored and valued in the class. And so, so I do that face-to-face -face and online. And you can have, um, it changes the group dynamic. They feel more comfortable talking. Um, it's not something that just necessarily happens. It's part of how you intentionally design the class. And so one of the things, um, so you can require students to complete a certain task that is aligned with something that's going to help create that more inclusive space. And you provide guidance and reflection opportunities. I provide a lot of reflection opportunities in, in my course. And one of the things it's designed to do is to help students see their their own talents and their own wisdom and that they have a valuable voice to share in this learning community. And so the reflections, I'll ask them to discover answers from within themselves so that they get comfortable realizing that they can answer some of the questions that they have knowledge. Um, and so I do that with a lot of my assignments. And um, I found that it does help students increase their confidence and, and their comfort because they see that, oh, yeah, they do know, know something about um, the topic or they have something to share about maybe what's happening in the current world or, or in their life or something that they learned in their um, educational or um, personal or professional experience that they might have. 
And another aspect of building that community is connecting with the professor. And I know I talk about this with my freshman students that, um, you know, just ask me a question. It's important to feel comfortable asking questions. Don't wait until it's too late to ask a question because then often it's it's harder to recover from if you waited. And so I'll set up some short meetings with every student and it's part of things that they're required to do in, in the course. And so I'll sit with them early in the semester and you know, ask them, you know, how they're doing, how's their classes going, is there something special that they um, need, is there or an issue that they're having, um, and, you know, kind of open that communication. And as I continue to converse with them and, you know, contact, make sure, you know, saying their names, and when I talk to them, I try to think of, oh, well, this person likes kayaking, or this person likes art or something, you know, so to bring in that personal, um, something unique about them, and it helps them to realize that they're seen in the community and they feel more comfortable um, asking me questions. And I have seen that, you know, I first have those meetings, the first, you know, I'll say, well, how are you doing, you know, and, and they'll say, oh, you know, everything's great, you know, and so you talk about, oh, how was your weekend, how was this or that or whatever, and then they go, oh, yeah, you know, I am kind of having a problem in this particular um, situation. Um, so then talking um, more about that and what kind of supports can be provided to help them. And so I definitely see that with students as I build that um, foundation and then continue that connecting. It seems like the connecting and the belonging is really, really, really key in helping them to feel like they can be successful and that they want to persist. And one of the things you can do is use Microsoft Bookings and I'll send you this PowerPoint after it has the link. And so if you want students to book online meetings with you, you know, even the brief ones, you can do it in Microsoft Bookings and this link will show you how to do that. And so it's a system that we all have access to and it's um, user friendly so that's a way that you can get you know keep that connection have those meetings with the students and they don't have to be long it's it's that contact connection type of situation that's really important and then niu navigate is um well let me go back so does anyone have, um, do any of you have those short required meetings with, with your students? Has anybody done that in their class? And it's a small group, so you can turn on your microphone and, and share if you'd like. Okay, so um, that's something to consider. And I definitely have seen that it's having a positive impact on my um, students and their engagement. And also I've noticed that they, um, go ahead, Diane. Okay, um, I was thinking about that with the short um, meetings and um, how would you, Oh, do you, it says something about I'm having trouble sharing my audio. Do you hear me? I do. You sound oh. great. Okay. I don't know why. It's it just very clear. <laughs> it just popped up and, and told me that. And I was like, okay. Um, so when you have the short meetings, do you, do you tell them that there's a theme to the meeting? I might not have caught that, but I, I know that sometimes students kind of, uh, as you already mentioned earlier, are nervous about, you know, um, mm -hmm. talking in class and things like that. But they're also nervous about having meetings with 
um, teachers because they think they're in trouble or something. So do you just say, look, you know, this is just a get getting to know you meeting or what is it that you, how do you present it? Yes, that's, that's a great question, Diane. And the points that you brought up are, it, that's one of the reasons that I do it is because students might not be comfortable talking to the professor and I bring it up in class, you know, please ask me questions. Um, I really want to help you. Um, and I'll bring in, um, you know, remembering when I was a student and thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I was, you know, not necessarily comfortable talking to the professor as well. So I, so I'll tell them that the purpose of the meeting is, you know, just to have a contact with you, getting to know um, you, you get, you know, they can ask me questions if they want, um, just to kind of have an informal touch base. And so I tell them, you know, if there's something that you need, some kind of resource you need at NIU, let me know. If there's some kind of uh, support you need for the class, let me know. I just want to open that communication and let them know that I'm there to support them. So yeah, it's kind of like an, it's an informal getting to know you, um, but, but I do require them. Um, it's, it's minimal points, but still it's, you know, there's, there's some points, the value of it um, for building that community is, is really high though. Um, but you're right, just explaining to them, you know, this is just a, I want to touch base, build this community, make sure that you understand that, that I'm here to help you if you have questions, um, and to, to reduce any potential stress that they might have about, about communicating with the, with the professor. And it's, it's, it's effective. And I'm going to have a second set of them um, around midterm. So, but I've definitely seen that that they, you know, more of them come up after class or more of them stay in the online room after class or whatever and ask questions. So, um, yeah, so just an informal getting to know you is fine. So they don't need to study or anything, but if there's something that they want to discuss with you privately, then that's a great time to do it. And then I also, um, you know, of course, let them know that I'm available um, other times as well, but this is one for um, that is required. And then navigate, um, just by a show of hands, do, do you all know about the NIU Navigate system? That, um, okay, so Diane, okay, so you know about it, okay. Um, and then do you use it, Diane, with your class or, or what is your experience with Navigate? I actually um, went on it recently to because I was directed there by the student athlete uh, assessment, you know, oh, to, yep. mm -hmm. um, it, it pushed me into navigate. And then okay. well, this is kind of a weird story, but maybe a word of caution about navigate at the moment is that I was looking for what I was supposed to do the student athlete um, report and I couldn't uh -huh. find it. Clicking around and I clicked on um, cases. And when I clicked on mm -hmm. cases, every single case that had ever been um, <laughs> uh, submitted came up. So I've reported that. So oh, <laughs> just good. at the moment, I would, that yeah. definitely, I'm like, ooh, okay, seems they need to get the bugs out of that a little bit. Yeah. I, I not want yeah. my cases to be seen. Mm hmm. I also know that, you know, sometimes the, the problem with this, what, what sis, we had some system before and that was some similar of reporting at risk or something. And I, I had heard negative feedback from students about it. They feel like you're getting them in trouble. Well, this is um, so so I'm glad that you um, raised that. So yeah. so I use it for there are different ways to use Navigate. And so what you're talking about is um, like sending an alert to one of their academic advisors. And so 
there's other features to it that that I've seen um, that students are excited about. And one of them is called, because you want to make those connections. We were talking about connections with the professor. And so now we're talking about um, like student to student connections. And Navigate has a feature that's a study buddy feature. And they can go in um, and students, so these were my freshman students, and I asked them if they knew about Navigate, and, and they did, because they use it to, I don't know if they use it to, well, they use it to communicate with their advisor and um, with their professors and things, but um, they can go in and join study buddy groups, and so then for their courses, they can go in and say, I want to be in a study buddy group for you know, this course or that course or whatever. And so that's a way for them to build connections and get support that is, you know, that student to student connection is really important. And um, I have seen students positively respond to the study buddy. Cause so if they don't know anybody in the course, but if they go in this navigate and then they can say, I want to be in study buddy, then other people who also want to be in study buddy um, get in that group and then they can work together in things. And so that's what I wanted to talk about in terms of um, a feature that I've seen students, you know, they kind of go, oh, I can go in there and, and get people to study with. And so uh, they've positively responded to that. Um, so that link will be in the the um, PowerPoint that I send as well. And so that's, um, you know, a resource and a support and connecting with the other students. And we know that if students are connected, they feel like they belong um, and they're getting the support that they need, they're more likely to persist and succeed because they feel that connection and they feel like they have these additional supports that they need. Um, so, so that's something to think about. And like I said, that link will be in the PowerPoint that I send. Um, okay, and then when you're doing projects and assessments and having, um, designing these and thinking about it, um, you might think about um, gamification, just, I mean, it doesn't have to be some really complicated game, but just adding in some feature of a game um, that it's fun, you know, there's a part of, of learning that if there's something that's novel, fun, engaging, it kind of piques their interest, and then they get more excited about it. And when they get more excited about it, they're more engaged in it. And so they'll be more likely to, to complete it and they can have success there solving problems, but they don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily feel like they're solving problems. Um, so there's some simple ones like scavenger hunt and um, a couple of weeks ago in my class I had, um, trying to teach them about the library and the extensive resources that the library has. And so I took them to the library and they did a scavenger hunt and the library now has centralized support resources. And you could do this, um, mine, this one particular one was a face-to-face, -face, but you could have them do an online um, scavenger hunt of the library or some place on campus that, um, to find out what's available for them and can support them, whether they're face-to-face -face or online. Um, and then correct, you know, when they submit the, the responses, correct them, clarify, things like that. But it's a way to get them to, to complete these activities, learn about um, the topic or the resources. There's some fun involved. Maybe there's some prizes something that's novel, engaging, um, and encourages them to, to continue learning. And I have a, a dear friend who is um, 
he had several different um, diagnoses for learning, different differently abled aspects of learning. And I was watching him one day when he was in, he was still in elementary school, but I was watching him um, play a video game. And he was very focused on the video game. And when he was learning, when he got to a part that he didn't understand, he would go to the different help and the different practices where you can learn about certain skills in the in the game. And then he would practice that, become proficient, and then go back to the game. And so it was really interesting because he didn't necessarily get that positive reinforcement in school, which was unfortunate. Um, but the way that that video game was set up definitely supported his learning. So he would come to a challenge, he would get go get some additional support, then he would come back, then he would successfully navigate that challenge and just kept going through that. So um, it definitely encouraged growth and revision. And so you want to kind of think about those things when you're designing your classes. Um, you might have themes. Um, the College of Business has some courses where they, they have projects and then they have um, where they present, what is that called, Shark Tank, where they present to the um, business people and then uh, a group wins the contract, you know, simulations like that. Um, and so those things, they're aligned with the, the topics of the course, but they take the learning into like a gamification type of um, scenario. And the students are engaged. And anytime you can have something that uses more of their senses then, um, you know, just reading, um, then that's going to engage them more and they're going to learn deeper and, and likely be more engaged. And then original student work, and a couple of people said they, they teach online and you can definitely have them submit their, um, you know, photos of something or something that they've been doing that relates to the topic and upload it in class. And I had, uh, you know, let the students know about STEM Fest, which was this past weekend, and then had a short assignment where they could, they were supposed to submit a video and then answer this set of questions about what they, they did. And um, that's uh, uploaded in Blackboard. So it's unique to the person and gives them gave them credit for going out and getting more engaged in the campus beyond the um, course. And sometimes you can share announcements that feature some of these events on campus. And then if you can find a way to weave it in aligned with your content, then bring it in as a way for them to share their original work. And um, then they're also getting engaged with the campus. And some of the things that I, um, you know, talk to students about, they, they were talking about, well, you know, they were not necessarily comfortable going to these different things, you know, and I share, okay, well, you know, just, just go and take some notes, take some pictures. Um, answer these questions, and then see if there's something that really grabs your attention and how that might help you connect more at school. How does that connect with our topic that we're talking about in class? How does it connect with the um, contemporary issues in our environment, in our social systems, things like that? Um, and then when it's their original work, you can see again that their perspectives are valued and they're more likely to continue to go down that path of, of gaining confidence and realizing that 
that they are smart, that they can persist if they come into a situation where there's a struggle, then um, they'll be more comfortable asking you questions and, and trusting in their own voice and knowledge. And some of the different projects that, um, there's so many different projects that you can do in, in class. There's just a few listed on the, on the screen. What kinds of projects do you all use? I know we have people from um, different disciplines. What kind of projects do you use in um, the accountancy or sociology or the women's studies or English? that might help the students to persist, work together in groups. Okay, go ahead, Diane. Um, so are these all just uh, the group projects? Idea of group no, they can be group, they could be individual, they could pair, you know, depending upon how it fits with your. Yeah. Uh, um, I feel like um, students get excited about something like a case study or uh, something that might uh, involve their own community. Like I've um, put together um, about like social problems, if you can figure out a certain thing that involves a uh, range of communities around Chicago area, you know, mm -hmm. and then it's clear at home, that seems to, yep. to um, get people engaged. Um, another, I guess you could call it a project, but um, it seems to fall into this category of performances. I was having trouble with um, students in reading groups um, reading the article and then talking with each other, that was getting mm -hmm. increasingly difficult over time. And mm -hmm. just because they don't want to talk and then they'd be like trying to just look on their phone and something like that, or they wouldn't have read the article and they wouldn't have anything to contribute. Mm -hmm. I started, and this is for theory class, then I started having them take the readings um, and turn those into skits. And they had to write a skit and the skit had to involve the five people that would have been, you know, or four or five people that would be in their group, mm -hmm. depending on the size of class, you know, how many people I knew would be in the, in their group. And then that dramatically changed the reading. You know, they, they had to read because they had to put together a skit and then mm -hmm. people, they kind of were able to work out and even the shy um, people in the group might end up being just playing a more minor role in the skit um, or um, something a little easier. And then the other ones that are more dramatic were able to <laughs> mm -hmm. play a leading role or do something like that. And I don't really, you know, grade them on how well <laughs> the performance yes. is, you know, because they're very quick mm -hmm. tools um, that they do this in and they're able to mm -hmm. do it. I mean, and, yep. and it seems to bond them. So that yeah. the whole purpose of the group work is to bond students together and get them to know each other. But just sitting there talking face to face doesn't seem to do it. But having something active where there yes. seems to be able to, to do that. And then the other thing, if you have a small enough class that I was like able to do this last semester was um, field trips and the field trips, kind of like you mentioned at the library, but the idea of field trips, if you have a small enough class and you can do a lot of different things on campus and then mm -hmm. that kind of bonds the group together. And, you know, especially if you along with the field trip. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Those are exactly. excellent. Those are excellent <laughs> ideas, Diane. Thank you for sharing oh. those. Sure. Sure. And yes. And it's interesting with the, with the skit or so it's, kind of gamification, you know, type of thing. So they're, um, when, so when I assign something, like you said, active learning is really, really important. So they get, they get engaged. There's these different 
activities that they're doing more than just sitting there reading something they're they're physically involved they're um involved with other people there's that community and connection and so so what i'll do is whatever type of project there is um and you bring up a really good point about on campus there are so many things to do on campus so think about you know the art museums or the exhibits or the events there's so many things to do on campus and so i'll have whatever the topic is if i'll have a, a couple of objectives just just something that ties back to the purpose um, and learning objectives of, of the course. Like you said, Diane, it's not, you don't, you know, go through some extensive rubric, but there's some kind of a connection um, with the reading. So they're supposed to do a skit that shows, you know, the meaning of, of this reading, or they're supposed to go um, to a certain, center on campus or an exhibit or something and then connect it back with um, something that's related to the topic and objectives of your course and and they'll remember that better because they were actively engaged it's it's more interesting there's a bit of novelty and we know that that helps to kind of kind of get them interested in learning and um and it's fun. Um, so yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And then using feedback to to keep them engaged is um, something to think about. And you want to make sure that you're you're thinking about self care and and um, being kind to yourself and realistic as the person teaching so that you can balance you know these these unique projects that you're having them do the active learning the connections with the students and all of that you want to make sure that what what you plan is realistic and doesn't spread you too thin um, that is not good for you as well so just keep that in mind that you're balancing it and like like Diane said that you have a skit, so you're using it as an engagement activity. And there's there's not a heavy duty grading associated with it, but their engagement has gone up and they're focused on the learning and the reading. So, um, you know, you're balancing that. So that's great. And then um, just, you know, think about students in terms of their, um, you know, they're thinking about their stress, getting good grades. How do they get to that next milestone? High grade point average. How how can you um, help them to kind of keep this in a realistic perspective as well? And um, kind of kind of keep them on pace um, for success instead of them just thinking, oh, you know, I just got to race to the to the finish line for graduation. We want to focus them on the present and try to help them to understand why this is important um, and keep it in perspective for their stress as well. Because if they're always thinking they have so many years ahead, it can overwhelm them. So we wanna um, also let them know about um, growth mindset, which is really important. It's um, the idea that students can learn if they persevere and they work hard they get resource support ask questions um, as compared to a fixed mindset where they um, think oh well you know i never was any good at this particular subject so i'm not going to be successful in this in this course so we want to make sure that we set up our class so it's built on a, a growth mindset that they can continue to to um, learn and address more complex topics. And so formative feedback helps to build that um, growth mindset. So we're giving them feedback while they are working, while they're learning something, it's in progress. 
And so we would say, um, you know, these are the strong aspects. This is, you know, you did a great job on this and, and why. And then the um, aspects where they have potential for, um, you know, making their product better, give them some specific suggestions that they can address and make sure that it's timely because we know that if, if feedback is delivered way past, um, you know, like a month after the students submitted their work, I mean, they've moved on um, and the likelihood that they integrate that feedback is, is much lower because, you know, they've moved on to a number of other um, assignments. We wanna make sure that we give our feedback timely and that we have them integrate that feedback into the next their next efforts. And so if you provide encouraging and constructive feedback, and a lot of times that's qualitative, but it helps students to say, yeah, you did a great job on this, and it's aligned with the um, this standard or this philosophy or whatever, and however you need to um, you know, dig deeper into this particular aspect because you didn't connect it with the principle of whatever, something like that. So they can see where they can focus their attentions to make it better. And it, that ongoing, um, that formative feedback while they're learning helps to draw out their best efforts. And so again, thinking about balancing your time and demands and your stress and the students um, supporting their success. Sometimes you might give feedback individually or as a group. Um, you might see a trend that a number of students were struggling with a certain aspect of an assignment. So maybe you tell them as a group that, um, you know, there were a number of questions about this or people seem to have a misunder misunderstanding about it. So let's address it as a group. Um, and then decide when does it make the most sense to give very detailed feedback and when does it make the most sense to give less detailed. And like Diane was saying, uh, so trying to get the students to read, had them do a skit. And so, you know, they hit those main points of the article. And so that so that's gonna be less feedback, but you say, yes, these were the main points of the article. You did that, great job. Um, but if you want them to make some substantial changes in a project and that's gonna be submitted again or a different phase of it's going to be submitted again later in the semester, then you um, consider giving uh, more detailed feedback earlier in the semester and then they can integrate that and make their final product better. And sometimes you can give digital feedback um, maybe you do an audio feedback. Sometimes that's faster. Um, sometimes you just do ungraded. You're trying to just do something quick to kind of get an idea of how they're doing. So it might be ungraded in class. Sometimes you can have peers or have themselves use a rubric to evaluate themselves. And I, I use rubrics in, in my classes and, you know, I'll tell the students if, if you use this rubric when you're creating the assignment, then you should be able to pretty much know what your grade is going to be because the, you're kind of giving, they're giving themselves feedback um, and overall reflections. And like I said, I use reflections a lot on science have students go back and connect that assignment, their learning, their progress with not only the topics of the course, but like I said, their learning and progress. So is there, so what went well? Is there something that they need to do for the future that might make this a more comprehensive um, project or um, something like that? So build in those overall reflections. Does anybody use reflection um, in their courses to kind of gauge how students are doing? Okay, go ahead, Diane. 
Oh, I, th- I, I thought you were just wanting us to raise our hand, but I'll quickly oh, say okay. that in my, since I'm doing online theory class, I can't do the, the skits that I talked about. And so instead mm-hmm. of reading reflection, I have them, I have them, uh, you know, put those in there and I respond to each one weekly. Um, mm-hmm. The one thing I thought when you first were talking about reflections that I was thinking about is that I know that it takes a while for some students anyway to get the idea of what you mean by reflection because um, they will either, well, at the worst, they will copy and paste the article, a <laughs> part of the article into the, that's, you know, that's one end of the mm-hmm. spectrum. And then mm-hmm. the other would be that they're just giving a summary, you know, and I'm like, you can, I want you to also say what you thought about uh, that. And then, mm-hmm. and then you will also have, you know, issues with them trying to uh, look at other sites or something. And I'm like, no, in your own words. So, mm-hmm. you know, so mm-hmm. it, it's a process, but I, it's yep. valuable, you know, but some students will very resistant to ever mm-hmm. like saying their opinions. And some of them I never end up getting to do that very well. But yeah, and and that's yeah, that's the words of um, experience and, and wisdom, you know, that it, it t- it's a process to get them to because at first, yes, they you get that kind of what do you mean by that? And so then when I'll have some. Just a simple structure with some simple prompts. And so, like you said, so so in your own words, um, sometimes you can use the journal. And the journal tool is is private, so that can open up some people sometimes if they don't feel comfortable doing this in a discussion board. Um, But like you said, it's a process, and you can see them become more accustomed to the reflection and gain deeper insights as the semester goes on. So it's good that you do that regularly because um, they get practice, and, and we know that learning involves repetition and that we practice and it's just like any of those those complex skills and knowledges that we have all developed we didn't just wake up one day and have them and and i tell my students that you know we it's taken years to develop this level of knowledge and skills and so you know they should think about when they first learn to do whatever it was um, play a video game, um, you know, like for me, ride a bike. I remember when I first learned how to, how to ride a bike. My dad gave me this giant bicycle and I was little, but that's the bicycle we had. So I said, is this really? Yeah, it's good. Just get on it, you know, and keep. <laughs> so I just kept getting on, falling off. And um, by the end of the day, I was riding down the driveway. <laughs> so just that they need to remember that this developing those skills of reflection and in all of the learning it involves the us you know getting outside of our comfort zone and, and it involves practice and vulnerability and I mean why would we be in college if we knew everything you know we need to um, there's always something else to learn so yeah that's great thank you Diane And so um, one of the examples of, of empowering students to revise is, so the average feedback would is um, the area is vague. I'm not sure what you mean. Um, so run on sentence, you need to do this. Great point. Um, you thoughtfully analyze the aspects, but the incentivized feedback is incentivizing them to to revise and you're giving them some information that they can build upon and integrate into it with the revision. So the example of you need more outside resources to support your claim. Okay, so they know right away, need more outside resources, gotta get some more. Um, how do you plan to build your credibility? And so they think, okay, I need to reflect on that. Let me figure out how do I, how am I gonna build my credibility? Um, so if there's a uh, writing type of issue, um, grammar or something, 
you identified a run on sentence, giving them feedback. Okay, where else can they correct these similar? They can go through and identify every one. Tell them, look, this is a run on sentence. Where else can you identify similar errors and correct those throughout this product, uh, this paper, whatever. And when you're looking at number three, great job analyzing the complexity of this argument. So you're providing some, you know, some positive feedback, supportive feedback. And then you're saying on the next research assignment, please be sure to continue to document all the opposing point, point, points of view. So, all right, you did a great job on the complexity of this. Next time, bring in um, opposing points of view. And so they know what to do. And there's, they're not just sitting there saying, I, okay, it wasn't, it wasn't as good as it could have been, but what do I need to do? So the incentivized feedback tells them what they need to do. And so they know, they feel that they can persist and be successful because they have an idea of what they're supposed to do. Um, yes, Diane, go ahead. Do you, um, Diane, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Sorry, I forgot no, to. No, you're fine. Okay, no, that's fine. Um, okay, so then grading for engagement. Um, you can have students, if you think about possibly postponing the grade, ask them to write down reflections about how they intend to incorporate the feedback um, and how they'll use those new, newly learned skills in their next assignment. And we talked about um, conferences, rubrics, having them self-grade. You can have random samples of student work, um, de depending upon how that works with your class. Um, And then um, we talked about practice, practice. And if you're going to have opportunities for revision, so then they should incorporate the, um, the revisions um, to get the uh, improved grade. Um, and you might revise till mastery, and then that would be um, the, the final grade that you put in for that product would be um, after they've mastered, that would be something that you would, um, you know, decide or, or say, okay, we're going to allow revisions until this date. And then what their grade is at that point could be recorded. So we talked about the importance of community and different ways you can use projects and assessments and engaging through feedback and then grading, um, to engage them. And so does anybody have anything else they want to add before, before we close out for today? Just want to say thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. It was great to talk with you today and um, wish you the best for the rest of the semester. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Lise. And you know, you can always get a hold of us in CIDL if you um, have questions or need assistance. Okay.